We left off with the dirty word, so we won't go over that again. Um, but we will pick up with Into Ashes and All My Lust on page 815. Right? This is Marvell's Two's Coin Mistress. So he says, Your quaint honor shall turn to dust. Honor and lust are both what? They're abstractions. They're not concrete physical things, right? And I think because he says your quaint honor, because of what he suggested the word quaint suggests, lust might suggest something else. Also might suggest something physical to match the quaint, if you will, his penis. Could be wrong, but I don't think so. The grave, and then you get one of the greatest couplets in English literature. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. That's an example of understatement that we'll come up to in literary terms later. How is it understatement? If you were to write something like that, prosaically on a paper that you were writing for me, I would put off to the side one of my sarcastic comments. Duh. Why does nobody embrace in the grave? Because you're dead. Okay. So, now therefore. Why now therefore? Well, the first two stanzas are like premises. One plus one equals. Now, therefore. So the first one begins, had we but world enough in time. The second one begins, now I hear time's winged chariot. Now, therefore. Let's what? While the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. What's the youthful hue? that sits on her skin. Hue means complexion, appearance. So her complexion, her appearance, sits on her like morning dew. What happens to morning dew once the sun rises and gets hot? It evaporates. That's what's going to happen to that youthful hue. That skin that is now soft and supple and beautiful will do what? Get old and wrinkled and she'll turn into a human sharpe. You know what a sharpe dog looks like. And while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires. Now, the speaker is assuming a little bit here. The speaker is essentially saying to her, like every quote-unquote pig man, my terms, has said to a woman, oh, come on, you want it. You want me. Her willing soul, he says, is doing that, doing what? Breathing out through her pores. Now, let us sport us while we may, and now like amorous birds of prey, sport us. What do you mean? Well, what does every sport involve? Every Football, baseball, basketball, soccer, hockey, uh, uh, ultimate frisbee, all involve what? If you're a participant in that, you're, you say you, you do what? I play. It's play. Okay? I play football, basketball, soccer, you know, what? Every freaking class. Let's play. Like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chap power. Birds of prey, give me an example. What is one? Eagle, hawk, falcon. Those are all birds of prey, okay? They're not vultures. It was a Renaissance commonplace that is a commonly held idea that birds of prey mated by flying way up in the air, get up there a mile or so, and then the male would mount the female and they would fall to the ground. They wouldn't be flapping their wings, they wouldn't be soaring. They'd be, and the ground's getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Okay? And she's kind of going, hurry, 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 hurry. This is why they are devouring time. So he's saying, let us 
Be like those birds. He's not saying let's go up to a cliff. And... He's saying let's use our time how? Set. <laughs> let's waste the time away. Not waste, throw away, but destroy time. Rather than languish in his slow chapped power. Slow chapped. Slowly chewing. Because what does time do to everything? It wears it down. You know? What are the oldest mountains in the United States? Anybody know? Smokies. Smokies used to be a lot taller than what they are now. The newest one, if I remember correctly, pretty sure it's the Rockies. Mm -hmm. Sierra Nevada are a little bit older than the Rockies. but So you've got the oldest... Smokies, Nevada, Sierra Nevada range, and then the Rockies in the middle. The implication is the Smokies, I mean, they might not have been as tall as the Rockies, but they were, they were a lot taller than they are now. Time has worn them down. So let's not let time do what to us. They're listening to old people that don't have any fun. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. All our strength, masculine, sweetness, feminine. Let's mix them all together so that you can't what? Tell strength from sweetness. Tell, tell male from female. Why? We'll just be one thing. Like a ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. You know, I've had students before in upper division courses who've written about this poem and they go, oh man, this is really cool. This guy's in the s and &M. No, he's not in a sadomasochism. He's not, she's not a dominatrix or anything weird like that. The rough strife, okay, tear our pleasures with rough strife. What is he saying? To get pleasure out of this life is striving. It's hard work, right? And no one really knows what the iron gates of life refers to. Is he talking about death? How's it, you know, if he is, then what is the speaker suggesting? How's it better to die? As an old man in a convalescent bed, you know, with tubes sticking all over out of your body, or with your lover in bed and to die of a massive heart attack, you know? Depends on what the meaning of the line is, which I have no idea. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, that is an illusion. We'll talk about that term later. We've already used it several times. It's an illusion to what? Joshua. When Joshua and people of Israel go over the Jordan and arrive in the Promised Land, Joshua's got to subdue various little cities. One of them at the city of Ai. He prays to the Lord, and God makes the sun stand still for a day so Joshua can wipe them all out. Though we cannot make our son stand still, he says, meaning make time stop. It's a commonplace idea in I don't know how many rock songs from 1965 to today. We're going to do what? We're going to slow down time. Why? So we can enjoy ourselves. Yet we will make him run. So if we can't stop time, we're going to make what? We're going to make time and work his you-know-what off to keep up with us. All right. All right. Go from there. Top of 816, illusion, I just talked about. What is it? It's a brief reference to person, place, thing, event, or idea in history or literature. Right? I mentioned, you know, the illusion to the passage in Scripture. We talked about with a good man is hard to find. How that title was possibly an allusion, okay, to the passage in the Gospels about the rich young ruler. Allusions can be strictly historical. If I were to say, I'll use this one. Bo Bergdahl is Benedict, is a Benedict Arnold. Okay, even if you don't know who Bo Bergdahl is, who's Benedict Arnold? 
or what was Benedict Arnold? Maybe you haven't been taught this because <laughs> history's not really taught. He was a traitor during the American Revolution. Okay, Bo Bergdahl was the American soldier serving in Afghanistan who one day just got up and walked off his post and got captured by the Taliban, held by the Taliban for five years. Obama traded him for five bad guys. And the Taliban just announced yesterday that the five bad guys had gone back and rejoined the Taliban. We were promised they wouldn't. Okay? So that's an illusion. You can have all kinds of illusions to historical, cultural, you know, things, etc. Okay, go from there to uh, no, not that one yet, not that one yet. Images. We've been talking about images. So what is an image? Well, what about that iron ball? Or that ball through iron gates of life? An image is any kind of language that appeals to the senses. Okay. Any of the senses. In poetry, it's primarily visual. But it can also be sounds. It can be something that appeals to the sense of taste, or the sense of touch, or the sense of smell, or the sense of um, eyes, seeing. For example, Barn Burning, that opening paragraph, you had all kinds of imagery. Right? Some of it was visual, and some of the visual imagery was designed to stimulate other senses. For example, when Sardi saw on those cans of meat the fish, what did it do? It made him hungry. Okay, that's a kind of a taste image as well as being a visual image. So look very briefly, it's not on the syllabus, but look very briefly at um, Juan Carlos Williams' poem titled simply, Paul. And then I'm going to read another one to you real quickly. If I can. Oh, that's right. As the cat climbed over the top of the jam closet, first the right forefoot, Carefully, then the hind stepped down into the pit of the empty flower pot. The entire poem is just an image of a cat stepping over something, right for pra first, and down into a flower pot. Listen to this one. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. It doesn't mean anything. It's just an image. And you're going to go walk around today for maybe a couple hours. You're going to have that image of that damn chicken or wheelbarrow with glistening water on it by some white chickens. Okay? All he's doing is creating, creating an image. Go from there to... No, I'm not going to do that one yet. Figures of speech. We use them all the time, right? We see them in the press. Trump's a pig. That's figure of speech. That's the use of metaphor. Okay? So, figure of speech is saying one thing in terms of something else. So we don't just say, he's a genius. We say, he's an Einstein. Doesn't mean he is a Einstein, literal you know, descendant. All right? They're designed to make things clear. They're not designed to, like parables seem to be, to make things unclear. So two most commonly used, simile and metaphor. You've all ta been taught before what a simile is or what a metaphor is. Simile, comparison using words like, as, than, etc. Metaphor, comparison without those, those words. Little poem on page 867. 
I love this poem, but it's really weird. It's disgusting, actually. Margaret Atwood, you fit into me. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. A fish hook. An open eye. What's wrong with the image? Okay. Notice, you fit into me like a hook into an eye. Simile, okay, a fish hook, an open eye. Well, the hook and eye in the first two lines, what does that refer to? Does that refer to a literal fish hook and a human seeing eye? Uh-uh. What's it refer to? Most of the men probably won't be familiar with, but most of you women might. You might have a dress that attaches in the back with what? A hook and an eye. Okay? The eye looks like this. You've got thread sewn through here. It's got a big eye. And then on the other side, you've got a hook. This goes into that. The purpose of this is for this to attach to it. The purpose of this is to attach to that. You fit into me like a hook into an eye. That is, your purpose is to fit into me. And then we get the next stanza. Fish hook and open eye. What does that completely do to the poem? Changes the meaning. Because fish hooks aren't supposed to be in, in eyes. Okay? Metaphor, uh, we already talked about metaphor. Um, implied next couple pages, implied metaphor, extended metaphor, controlling metaphor. Implied metaphor, we do this all the time. You could say, you know, the example that's given there, bottom 868. You could say about somebody, he was a mule standing his ground, okay, which means the man is a mule, X is Y, but to say he braved his refusal to live, to leave, implies he's like a donkey, implies he is stubborn, okay? Look at the poem on page 762. This is in the, um, for the discussion of extended metaphor or controlling metaphor. Extended metaphor or controlling metaphor, when you have a metaphor that goes all throughout the poem, that determines the poem. So the poem Catch, page 762. What is this? This is a poet throwing a poem to a reader. Two boys, uncoached, are tossing a poem together. Overhand, underhand, backhand, sleight of hand, every hand. Teasing with attitudes, latitudes, interludes, altitudes. High, make him fly off the ground for it. Low, make him stoop. Make him scoop it up. Make him as almost as possible miss it. Fast, let him stink from it. Now, now, fool him slowly. Anything, everything, tricky, risky, nonchalant. Anything under the sun to outwit the prosy. Over the tree in the long, sweet cadence down. Over his head, make him scramble to pick up the meaning. And now, like a posy, a pretty one, plump in his hands. The speaker means a poem is like a game of catch. Do you want, in a game of catch, if you ever played catch when you were little, do you want to just stand there with the other person 10 feet away and throw it like that or throw it underhand and make it real easy? No. The idea is to, when you play catch, you're working on your catching skills. So you throw it hard, you throw it with some heat, you throw it outside to make them reach, you throw it up high to make them reach down there, go down low, maybe dive. A poem is the same. The poem should not always be pitched exactly the same. A poem should do what? It should make you work. It should make you stretch. Okay? So that's a controlling metaphor. Look at the poem on 869. This is one on the syllabus, so we'll do it now. We'll do it later. The author to her book. Anne Bradstreet is the first American poet. Okay. 
lived in the 17th century. The controlling metaphor in the poem is of the book as a child, or the poems in the book as her children. You could say, the poems are like children, make a simile, or say her poems are children. In the, the context, the background is her brother-in-law visiting found a copy of her manuscript poetry. That is, a collection of all her poems written down. And he took it, and he went back to England, and he had it printed, he had it published. Title was The Tenth Muse. There are only nine muses in ancient Greece. Okay? Each one has kind of a different aspect of writing and such, poetry and epic and things like that. She's the tenth muse. In other words, she's the new goddess of poetry. He did that without her permission. And then he comes back to the United States and he brings a copy of the book and gives it to her. And this poem kind of expresses to us what she felt about that. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth did by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view. So, ill-formed offspring. Describing her quote-unquote children as what? Handicapped, crippled, deficient. Okay. Why? Because her brain was feeble. Who after birth did by my side remain. How, how did it remain, or they remain, by her side? Well, she wrote her poems and did well with them. Stuck them in a drawer. She didn't let anybody else read them. Till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true. Notice, the friend was true. The friend thought he was doing something that would be good for her, but he wasn't very wise. Why? Because he didn't ask. Who the abroad exposed to public view. Now, abroad can mean way over there in England. It can also mean abroad how? Outside our home. Outside the door. He shooed you outside. Made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not less than all may judge. Why made thee in rags? Okay, one that's talking about the kind of paper these poems are written on. Rag paper, it's not wood pulp, it's cotton paper. Where you take rags, you boil them down so that even, essentially what you get in a pot is just mushy stuff, okay, to make this kind of paper. And then you pour it out over these forms, these flat like screens. And you press it very tightly, and that produces rag, cotton, linen, paper, okay. So he takes the in rags, halting to the press to trudge. Why halting? Again, it's the kind of the crippled image. Where errors were not less than all may judge. At this point in time, when people would have stuff printed, errors often kind of crept into the printing. How so? They're not printing like on a computer, obviously. So you've got a desk like this, and it has a compartment up here. And here you have letter forms, A's, B's, C's, D's, etc. And up here you have those letter forms too. The letter forms down here are all small, what we call lowercase. The letters here are all capital, what we call uppercase. Lowercase because it's in the lower part of the cabinet. Uppercase because it was in the upper part of the cabinet. That's where we get those two terms from. Okay, So she says, more errors crept into the printing as a result of this. How does that happen? Have you ever heard the phrase, mind your P and Q's? What does P and Q stand for there? Printing. 
the letter P, right, and the letter Q. What's the difference between them? Q's got this little what's called a serif off to the side. But often, this little piece breaks off. Now what's the difference? It's merely the direction you're facing. So the reason you have to mind your P's and Q's is you don't want to write P-U-I-C-K. Because quick doesn't make any sense. Okay? Where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return, my blushing was not small. Meaning, when I saw you in print, I was embarrassed. Why? My rambling brat in print should mother call. The Kent Muse and Bradstreet. She was embarrassed by how they appear. I cast thee by as one unfit for life. She put them back in the drawer or something like that. Thy visage was so irksome in my sight, yet being mine own, that is because you are my children, at length affection would they blemish as a man so I could. So I got a rag and I tried to clean your face. How many of you have ever, I used to do this all the time in grade school, especially when I had math tests because I absolutely detested math. How many of you have ever, you know, in trying to make a correction on a paper, you erase, 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 and the paper rips? That's what she's talking about. Being my own at length affection would thy blemish as a man if so I could, I washed thy face, scrubbing, 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 but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet. I mean, when I used the term earlier that they were cripple, this is why. We haven't talked about feet yet. We'll talk about that next time we meet, probably. She's talking about the meter. That is... The lines of poetry ought to have a certain number, number of syllables. Iambic pentameter meter has five okay, feet to it. It has ten syllables. But she's implying uh, some of your lines only have nine syllables. So I had to stretch them. How? You put in another syllable somewhere. Or maybe more than that. Yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meet. You're still a little crippled. You're still kind of like Oedipus. In better dress to trim thee was my mind, but not save homespun cloth in the house I find. That is, before I turn you out of doors, I'd really like to dress you nicely, put you in good clothes. But all I have here at home, stuff I made. Homespun cloth means everything was made by me. It also implies something about the subject matter of her poems. It all centers around the home. Family relationships. Her husband, her children, her house, her livestock. Pretty much it. And that's almost everything Anne Bradstreet writes about. And death, because a lot of people die in her family. So she says, in this array, amongst vulgars mayst thou roam. That is, in what? In this book. Among vulgars, common people, ordinary people, everyday people. You and I, so to speak. May you roam. May, may these kind of people look find you. Critics' hands beware. Thou dost not go. Why? Because what's a, a literary critic is going to rip you apart. They're going to say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And take thy way where thou where yet thou art not known. And if for thy father ask, say thou hadst none. Why? Well, like Venus, where do her poems come from? They're sprouted out of her mind. They have no father, per se. And for thy mother, she, alas, is poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of doors. 
So why does she take the volume that her brother-in-law publishes and then fix the poems and send it back out? The sending back out, she has them republished. She now knows, well, I'm not such a bad poet. People are buying these things. I can write more. I can make a buck off of this. Okay. Notice the metaphor that goes all throughout. The poems are children. Right? Page 871, pun. You all know what a pun is. You've certainly seen puns. You use puns all the time. Don't worry about the other term there. 873, personification. We talked about that. You know, good man is hard to find. How are the woods described? A gaping mouth. Okay. Apostrophe, an address to someone who is absent, who cannot hear the speaker, or to something non human that can't comprehend it. Page 874, overstatement, hyperbole. We don't need to talk about those. Understatement, as I said, where you say something less than what's intended. The grave is a fine and private place, but none, I think, do their embrace. Duh. Paradox, oxymoron. Statement that appears to be self-contradictory, but a closer inspection turns out to make sense. The pen is mightier than the sword. Well, how is a pen mightier than the sword? What can you do with a pin that you can't do with a sword? Louder? Yeah. Right? What else? Well, if you can write, what can you do? Express what? Ideas. Ideas. Ideas are far more dangerous than physical weapons. Which is why every totalitarian state tries to do what? limit the ideas people can have. Yeah, they also take away the swords. Okay? Just go to China today. Try to get go to China today, go to Beijing, try to get on Google and search for China is a totalitarian despotic cesshole. And you're gonna get a knock on the door. Oxymoron is a form of paradox that's greatly condensed. And you got some examples there. Sweet sorrow, silent scream, sad joy, cold fire, virgin mother. I mean, that's kind of the quintessential. How can you be a virgin and a mother? And then you have that little short poem there, The Unkindest Cut. Knives can harm you, heaven forbid. Axes may disarm you, kid. Guillotines are painful, but there's nothing like a paper cut. And if you've ever had a bad paper cut, you, you know, it's true. Do guillotines hurt? What's a guillotine do? Cut your head off. No, it doesn't hurt because it's instantaneous. But a paper cut? Sucker hurts for days. Right? Go from there to... Symbol, Allegory, and Irony, chapter 27, page 888. Symbols we've talked about, something that represents or stands for something else. Okay? You can have all different kinds of symbols. The next couple pages are going to talk about literary symbols, conventional symbols, etc. You know, so what symbol, or what two symbols maybe, Go with Valentine's Day. Hearts and flowers. Hearts and flowers. What kind of flowers? Roses. roses. you got to be the right kind of flower. You know? has to be red roses, too. There is actually a variety of black rose. You don't want to give that to your quote-unquote beloved on Valentine's Day because that's kind of, you know, it's the kiss of death. Okay? But hearts and roses. Look at the poem on 889. It's on the syllabus later, so we won't discuss it later. Robert Frost acquainted it with the night. Let's read through it, and let's talk about symbols, not what they symbolize or represent, but just things that get used as symbols. I have been one acquainted with the night. 
I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. <clears throat> so what are some possible symbols? What one word gets repeated again and again and again? Night. Okay. What's another word that gets repeated? Rain. Walk. Look at the first stanza. Three simple, short statements. Each one ends with a period. I have been one acquainted with the night. Look at the verb tense. Have been acquainted. That implies what? Is it solely used to? No, it's not. If it were solely used to, it would be, I was one acquainted with the night. That is, started in the past, ended in the past. But I have been means it began in the past and it continues now. Okay? So I have been one acquainted with the night. What's it mean to be an acquaintance? Is an acquaintance a friend? No. It's somebody you've met, maybe more than once. But they're not somebody you would really rely on or trust on for something. So I have been one acquainted with the night. So if it's acquainted with the night, the night isn't just the night, right? Because everybody is acquainted with the night. Everybody knows what the night is. So it must mean more than just darkness that comes at the end of the day. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. Now, rain here can be literal rain. Have you ever gone for a walk in the rain? I have. I have outwalked the furthest city light. Now, we're probably not talking, because of where Frost lives, we're not talking New England. We're not talking a large city. We're talking a small town. So the furthest city light is the last street light or the last house light in the town. So the speaker has walked from where the speaker lives out past that place and back. Light, by the way, is another image. I have looked down the saddest city lane. Notice, a fourth short declarative sentence. It ends right there. So the first Stanza, three of those. The second stanza begins with that and then does what? With the next line and a half, or next two lines. You have a run-on line. That is, the idea doesn't finish at the end of the line. It runs to the next one. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes. Pause. Unwilling to explain. Who's the watchman? Or what's the watchman? Cop. The cop on his beat. The cop walking his beat. His particular part of the town. So he passed by the cop and did what? Looked down. Dropped my eyes. That is, doesn't look at the cop. Why? Unwilling to explain. Explain what? Louder. Which way does the wind blow? What the hell are you doing out here? What you walking for? What time of day is it? It's night time. Does that mean it's 7 o'clock? No, the implication is it's wind. It's late. It's like midnight. One, two, three. I have stood still. Now look what happens. 
So first stanza, each line ends at the end of that line. Second stanza, first line follows the pattern for the first stanza. And then the next two lines go on. Third stanza doesn't even finish the idea. It finishes in the fourth stanza. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. And then you pause. Okay? So, I've stood still and stopped the sound of feet. Whose? His. His. He's walking on along and he stops. Why does he stop? When far away an interrupted cry. Notice the cry gets stopped somehow. And what is the cry according to the speaker? The cry comes over houses from another street. Here's one street. Here's a row of houses. Here's another street. The speaker's walking down one street. He hears a cry from the street next door and stops. And we have to go to the fourth stanza to find out why he stops. But not to call me back or say goodbye. What does that say about why the speaker is walking? Guilty? Guilty of what? What else could it be? If he stopped and says, but not to call me back or say goodbye, then what is the speaker telling us about what he is hoping that voice is calling for? Come back. Or goodbye. Well, what's the difference between come back and goodbye? Let me back up. Take come back out. Why would the voice, possibly, from the other street, be calling out goodbye? Now, when the speaker is already two streets away. What might that say about how the speaker left? Snuck out. Louder? Snuck out. Snuck out? An argument? Fight! Slams the door, leaves, and then... But stopping to hear that means what? Wants to go back. Not to call me back. Or say goodbye. See, the call me back is, please, call me back. And further still at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky. Claim the time was neither wrong nor right. What is this clock? It's the moon. How do you know it's the moon? It's an unearthly height. It's not on the earth. Okay. How can the moon be a clock? Well, you can see how it moves across the sky. You get an idea. It waxes and wanes. Okay. What do we associate with the moon? Nighttime. What else? What words do we get that are related for to the Latin word for moon? How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels? Or even some of them? Who becomes one of Harry's best friends? Beginning in book five. Luna Lovegood. Luna, lunar, the lunar cycle. What is lunacy? If someone is a lunatic, they're crazy. Why? Because they're under the influence of the moon. That's what that means. Okay. So this luminary clock, luminary means it lights. Okay. Does what? It proclaims the time was neither not wrong nor right. The time for what? Because when you're saying the time is neither wrong nor right, you're implying it's a time for something. 
Leaving? Leaving how? Simply leaving the wherever the voice was calling from? That kind of leaving? Or might the speaker be talking about some other kind of leaving? Come back. Louder. Okay. What might the night be? Depression, which can lead to death. How? Is I have been one acquainted with the night, the speaker saying, yeah, I've been depressed before. I know what it's like. If you've ever been depressed, really depressed, you might identify a little bit with the speaker if you're of this kind of temperament. That is, going out for long walks. What does it, why does a depressed person go out for long walks? They try to work things out up here. Okay. Well, by, by, why might the person be depressed? Because whoever was in that other house didn't call out to stop. Okay. I'm not saying that is. It's usually read, the poem is usually read as, at the most, Dealing with thoughts of suicide. At the least, depression. And acquainted with the night deals with depression. Because what do we say when we're ill? We often say we are under the weather. Well, look at the weather outside. The sun's shining. The trees are beautiful. That's, I'd like to be under that weather. I'd like to be under the weather in the Bahamas at certain times of the year. But when we say we're under the weather, what does it mean? means we're like Eeyore in the old Walt Disney Winnie the Pooh cartoons, walking around with the gray cloud in the showers, the rain always over him. That is, acquainted with darkness and despair. Okay? Go from there. Conventional literary symbols on the next page. Pretty clear what those are. Allegory. See, equated with the night isn't an allegory. Why? Because we can't say the night is only despair or depression. It can have multiple meanings, one of which can simply be the night. Okay? For it to be an allegory, it would have to be clear that night referred to only one thing. One of the greatest, the greatest, um, Allegory in the English language, I think I've mentioned this before. John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. In Pilgrim's Progress, you have a central character whose name is Christian. Christian always, always, always only represents Christians, never represents Jews, or Buddhists, or Muslims, or Baha'is, or Hindus, or whatever your religion. Nope, always Christians. Okay? There's a poem written about, I don't know, 80 years before that called The Fairy Queen. And it begins with this guy who's called Sir Red Cross Knight. Why? Because he has a white shield with a big red cross in the center of it. He is always the ideal of the Christian knight. He can never be read any other way. Okay? A lot of people think the book of Revelation in the, Old Te in the New Testament is allegory. It's not. It's symbolic because various images there can mean more than one thing. Okay? Allegory, your gloss tells you, your text tells you, lends itself to didactic poetry. That's not true. It is didactic poetry. Allegory is always meant to teach something. And in allegory, the author is always saying, you have to read this the way I want you to read it. It can only be read this way. Okay? Some people read the Harry Potter stories allegorically. Harry is Jesus. No, no, he's not. <laughs> Why? Because we know who his parents were. Exactly. They were James and Lily Potter. They weren't Lily and God, so to speak. Okay? Page 893, Iron. 
we know what irony is because we talked about it. When there's a discrepancy between what appears to be and what's actually true. Look at the little poem, Richard Corey. I, I love this poem because it's so ironic. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. We people on the pavement, that can mean homeless people, or at the time when this is written, hobos, bums, okay? Could also mean people who work on the street, manual laborers and such. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked, but still he fluttered pulses when he said good morning, and he glittered when he talked. So the people who see this Richard Corey, I mean, they're just really impressed by him. He was rich, yes, richer than a king. Admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. They see this guy and they're like, why can't that be me? It's not fair. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. Doesn't mean that they only live at nighttime. Waited for the light might mean waited for our death to come to bring us out of this darkness, think Oedipus, and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, he went home and put a bullet through his head. There's the irony. They think he's got everything made. And what does he do? Takes his life. Go from there to, last thing we'll do for today, sounds. You got a couple different kind of ballads referred to on 917. Those are terms you need to know. We'll talk about Scarborough Fair later. Onomatopoeia 921, you probably learned about that. Great school, I would hope. You know, quack, buzz, rattle, bang. Sounds that mean what they, words that mean what they sound like. And then you have, <coughs> uh, my throat. page 922, alliteration assonance. Alliteration, words that begin with the same consonant sound nearby. So, you know, the crappy car. The beautiful blonde, the, I don't know, pick your whatever. That's an example of alliteration. Some would, will say <coughs> that alliteration can also occur when you have the consonants in the middle of words, like the brittle little light. Brittle little, even though that's rhyme, okay? Assonance, repetition of the same vowel sound in nearby words. Now, this is within words. Asleep under a tree, time and tide, haunt and haunt, etc. So if it produces a kind of a musical pleasing sound, it's called euph euphony or it's euphonic. Eu, E-U, Greek means beautiful or pleasant. Phony, sound. If it's like this, if it's jangling, if it's not pleasing to the ear, it's cacophony, all right? Page 924, rhyme. Words that repeat the same sound. Happy, snappy, trippy, dippy, etc. But then you have I rhyme. I rhyme are words that look alike, but they don't sound alike. Here's one of the greatest examples. They look alike, they spell the same, but they don't sound the same. Through, bow, cough, though, enough. How can O-U-G-H have all those different sounds? It's because of French, when it entered the English language in the uh, Middle Ages. Okay, we'll stop that. Stop there. We will pick up when we next meet on page 927. It's probably going to be Monday.